So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Curran, and um, tonight's tutorial is about splitting charts. So let me just show you what I'm going to cover, like sort of fast-paced. We're gonna. I'm assuming that you sort of know the material from this previous uh, screencast I did called Introduction to D3, where, which covered this bar chart example, this line chart example, and this scatter plot. And what I'm going to cover here is how to take a, a single bar and split it into multiple bars, you know, horizontally like this, and then also how to split it uh, vertically like this, and then split that even further to be um, a stacked bar chart like this, where there's multiple stacked bars. And then adding a color legend, doing grouped bars, and then doing a, a circular version sort of of the same thing, where, where we can create a pie chart, and then a donut chart, and then do like small multiples of these different pie chart variants. And then also I'm going to cover uh, line charts and how to make a line chart with multiple lines like this, and then also an area chart, and then splitting an area chart into a stacked area chart. So I, hopefully I'll be able to get through it all today. Um, and I wanted to do it as a live event so you can sort of stop and ask questions uh, about things that are not clear. But I don't want to spend time on the things that I covered in the previous thing. So if you have a question about how, like how the nesting works, how the layered stacked layouts thing is working, feel free to interrupt me. What is D3? <laughs> well, D3. <laughs> right. <laughs> so before I talk about the visualizations, let me introduce the data that I'll be using. So I'm using uh, two data sets. One of them is population data from the United Nations. And this is the kind of data that you see if you Google, uh, what's the population of China? So if you Google what's the population of China, this is what you get. They did this really nice visualization work. So it says China, India, US, and this is a line chart of the populations of these various countries. And so I've, I've prepared these different CSV files. This is like, this is the current world population. This is the world population by year from 1950 to 2015. I got the updated version. And then uh, population by country by year. So this is the population data. And then there, another data set is um, from the Pew Research Center that collects data about religions. And um, it's from this, this report that they did, the global religious landscape. So it's like of the world population, what are the various uh, proportions of different religions through the world and then broken down by country. So here's, oh, whoops. Yeah, religion by country. And I just took the, f the, the top five countries of the world. So it's a small, manageable data set. So here's like in China and in India, the US, Indonesia, and Brazil. These are the top five largest countries in the world. So for these, we have the, the religious uh, breakdowns. So this is the data that we're going to be looking at. And let me just uh, dive right into the examples. Could I yeah. A meta question. Yeah, meta question. So you're going to show various visualization, but what's the motivation for it? What's the motivation for this? Not like, you know, if you can speak more like when somebody goes and look at data, how do they go about exploring? Yeah, right. I mean, so from. From my personal standpoint, I've been working on this project called Chiasm for the past eight months at Alpine. This is an open source thing. And I've added uh, really only a few visualization types into this, but I want to make it a general system. And so these are sort of, this is what I've explored so far. It's like line chart, bar chart, <coughs> and scatter plot, pretty much. And scatter plot has these different variations. But a lot of the data that you come across um, can't be expressed in these charts. It has like maybe another dimension of data. 
And so I've seen these various different kinds of visualizations that exist, like small multiples and stacked bar charts, grouped bar charts, and uh, things like that. And I want, I want to integrate those kinds of visualizations into this Chiasm project. Uh, so then it'll be like more of an open source, uh, almost like a Tableau-like uh, thing that's open source. So yeah, that's, that's basically the theme, is like once you introduce another dimension of data, how does that introduction of another dimension correspond to the visual presentation of it? You know, how can you modify a bar chart uh, and a circle and a line to accommodate an additional dimension of data? And if you want to do like visualization of big data, usually what you need to do is reduce the data first and compute like a data cube, an OLAP cube, and all the data sets that we're going to show here is essentially a data cube. And that's what you get when you aggregate over you know, massive amounts of data. And that's usually how, it's how, how big data gets presented in tools like Tableau or ClickView, that sort of thing. So I'm assuming that you understand uh, this code for this bar chart. Um, and I'm also assuming you understand the code for this line chart with the axes and everything. So these, these are the visualizations covered in this previous tutorial, Introduction to D3, which there's a big video about. This is a whole other set of examples that sort of build up to those. There's like 107 examples. So using that as our starting point, let's explore this theme of splitting the charts with an additional dimension of data. So let's say we just have a single number that we want to present, the population of the world. Uh, we can represent the population of the world as a single bar. And so this is a modification of that previous bar chart example that shows this number, <clears throat> the population of the world. And so you can see it's a CSV file that has one entry, you know, the world population. And uh, the only modification I had to do to the bar chart example is right here, it's loading in this new file. And then at the top, I modified the columns to correspond to the data table. And uh, I'm going to sort of take a side route about customizing a number, the number format right now. Because the first thing I saw is like, it says 2G, 4G, 6G, and what's G? You know, I, if I were to present this to somebody, they'd be like, what's G, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, 4G, it's like a better cell phone, right? <laughs> um, and so I'm like, well, okay, I just want to change this to be billions. like. B, 2B, 2 billion. Uh, so this is using the, uh, where is it in here? The, it's the, the tick format for the y-axis is D3 format S, which is the um, SI standard, standard, uh, standard abbreviation. So G means giga, which really means billion. So if we wanted to change this to say B instead of G, uh, here's how we could do it. So on the number format, the tick format that you pass into tick format of D3 is really a function that gets called for every element of the data. And so here's a custom tick format function that takes as input an element and then it just, it uses the SI format. The output of this will be like 2G or 4G and then it's just a string replacement operation that replaces G with B. So there's a little sort of side side road of how, how do you customize a number format to display B instead of G. So, so now it's like more acceptable to me, like, you know, 2B two, two is 2 billion. So that you can see the world population is around 7 billion right now. Can you trust them just coming up with a different format altogether, like the C format, and doing it there? What, what was the question? Can you contrast this approach, which is just a string replacement, which is Maybe more prone to errors because there's everything. Yeah. We're coming up with a whole new format, like C format function. Yeah, the question is can you compare this with coming up with a whole new number format? Um, well, not really because I haven't, I haven't created my own number format. But it's really just a function that takes as input the number and gives as output a string. And so, like, the sky's the limit. Uh, but there's a ton of built in things that come with Z3. I haven't really explored it all that much, so I'm not sure I can really comment. Uh, I can comment a little bit. 
Yeah. If you go, there's a, a person named Sam Armstrong. Oh yeah, she's great. And if you look on her blocks, she's got a number format example and a time format example. Um, I think it's Sam Armstrong. Not me, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's basically, so here it is, time formatting. Example. Well, she's got it right next to that, there's a number formatting one too. I found this helpful because you can type in stuff in row, second, Last example. Bo bottom row right next to the number. Yeah, oh. there you go. This one. Oh yeah, this is dealing with the these custom strings of D3 format, yeah. Yeah, so you can get different number formats from um, her, her stuff here. You can type in, um, I actually used this this weekend to do a custom date format. Oh, cool. Um, and um, basically, uh, she's got the documentation for format specifiers up there, and you can play with those formats, type type a number into the box, and what it'll look like will come out. Uh, cool. Yeah. So if you want to experiment and kind of get a, a you know your own examples of how this works, uh, Zan's done a really good job of giving you a place to play here. Right on. So moving right along. <laughs> um, right, so, so this, is, this is the world population for the entire world, but let's, uh, let's break it down a little bit. So now I'm going to look at the top five countries of the world. So I just did a filter you know, on the United Nations population data, what are the top five? Here they are. And here's the population. So you can see like China and India are about the same size, and then the US is like a lot smaller than that and then it sort of tapers off Indonesia and Brazil. So just this by itself, I was, you know, it's pretty interesting to look at this and realize how much bigger India and China are than the US. It's pretty, pretty extreme. But anyway, in, in the code, the only real thing that's different is the data here. And, you know, this, this line has been changed and the X column is now country. That's the only stuff that's changed because this bar chart was written in a general way so you can change it like this. Yeah. The ticks were set to five before, and now I see there's more than five ticks. So, what was the purpose of setting them to a number? So you said ticks was set to five here. Yeah. And it still is, but when you call dot ticks here, mm -hmm. you're you're specifying an approximate number of ticks, not an exact number. Yeah. And then it will get as, you know, the way that the D3 axis is implemented, it will get as close to this number as it can, with having nice numbers. So like 0, 200, 400, rather than like if you were to split the interval into exactly five bins, you would get these like, you know, 5.372 like weird not nice numbers. So even though I specified five here in the code, it, it'll give me maybe more than five up there. It'll get as close to a uniform problem in distribution as possible. Yeah, it'll get as close as it can. So when you don't know what's going to be, like you would just have to pre well, you can give it five all the time, and depending on the range, it will choose as close to five as it can. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, the axis ticks. Yeah. So, he, so here's splitting the world basically into these five separate bars. And this is not all the population. Um, so this is exploring, yeah, splitting it by population. But what if we split by religion? So here's what that looks like. The data set here is um, these various different religions, the totals for the whole world population. And I just changed the bar chart to use this data, but then we run into this problem of overlapping labels. And this is a problem that's plagued me a lot because um, at Alpine we're trying to build t visualizations <laughs> that will work on any input, right? And if you make a bar chart like this, it, it, the, the visualization has to have like something more intelligent where it will not have these overlapping labels. So let me just take another detour here of how to deal with this problem. 
So one thing you could do is make them small enough so that they don't overlap, right? Just so I changed the CSS here. The font size is five points now, but uh, you can't read them, so that's not acceptable, right? So another solution is to tilt them. So here's what it looks like when you just tilt them. Uh, they're readable and they don't overlap. So this is like, you know, it's, a, it's a reasonable solution for me. And I just basically Googled, how do you have a tilted labels? And I came up with this uh, blog post, which is really good. And um, you just use a transform on the text element of the ticks. And so over here in the code, you see where it's been modified. Um, so when you call x axis g dot call x axis, this invocation creates these text elements here and all the tick marks. And so after that's been called, that gives you a D3 selection. And so based on that, you can say dot select all text. That will give you a, a D, another D3 selection that has all of the text elements selected. And so then you can work with those and, and set the transform of each of these text elements to be rotated by minus 20 degrees. So this is another little detour. How do you do tilted labels so, so the, the labels don't overlap? But anyway, what we get is a bar chart of world religions. So you can see like the, the most popular religion is the world is, in the world is Christianity and then uh, the order is Christian, Muslim, unaffiliated is number three. I thought that was interesting. And then Hindu, Buddhist, folk religions, other religions, and, and Jewish uh, is the, the yeah, smallest. Yeah, I think maybe the name of the religion would be Islam, not Muslim. Muslim is the... Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true, that's true. I, I just took this data. I didn't, I didn't come, just, up, come up with these, but... Realize. Yeah, I guess Muslim should be Islam. Oh, it's not I mean, no, it's not yeah, I don't know. I just sort of took what, what was there, and I thought, well, they can they can deal with the, what's politically correct, you know. <laughs> we have to fix this. It's a visualization problem, right? <laughs> But anyway, these are like, these are the two main dimensions, dimensions that we'll be splitting by today, religion and country. And so, now what I want to do really is instead of, instead of splitting the bars horizontally, I want to split it vertically. So, the previous example shows the, the world has a single bar. I want to split that vertically to just see how you can do it with D3. And so, um, if we do that, we need to be able to, dis to distinguish between the different layers. And so before we actually do the splitting, we're going to add color. So make, make everything color coded. So let me just show you how, how that's done. It's using this d3.scale.category10 as these colors, this, these canned, this canned set of nice colors um, that, that come with the ship with D3 pretty much. And so this will give you uh, an ordinal scale where the, the range is these, uh, this set of colors. So let's see what it looks like. And so I've introduced an, a new variable here called color column, which in this case is the same as x column. But I made it this variable just to deal with it, you know, just with the bits of code that deal with the color. So color column is religion. And then here we're saying the color scale is d3 dot scale dot category 10 so we can use it and then in the render function we're setting the domain of the color scale so the the input values to be data dot map so for each element of the data and remember data is read in from the CSV file so there's one data entry per uh, religion so data dot map function D return D uh, at the color column. So it will re this will return the religion, the value for religion. So D at color column will be Christian or Muslim or unaffiliated. And so this will be the domain of the color scale. And then when we make the bars, we're adding another attribute here, the fill, which is the color. 
and we're just evaluating the color scale based on the value for the color column. It's following a similar pattern for, from the X scale and the Y scale. So, yeah, this is how we can add, add color, you know, make the bars color coded. So, you have the default over there. What if I want to like cooler or whatever and I have my other, another color scale design? So, you would feed that in as another function? Uh, how would you? So, how would you make custom colors? Yeah, and have that default to have a set of different um, color scales, either the default or custom color scales. Oh, if you wanted to, if you wanted to change the color scale dynamically, yeah. is that what you're asking? Yeah. I, you know, I, I think so. What I did for something, I I, I took uh, I just recently did a chart for um, blood pressure, and um, so I took the the color values from um, the American Heart Association, mm. and I wrote a little function that said, you know, if Systolic pressure is this, in this range, return this color. If uh, diastolic is in this range, return that color, so forth. <coughs> you write your own little function. Um, these are basically convenience functions, and Mike Bostock took a look at what colors look good in different combinations. And so he wrote category 10 and category 20, which gives you you have ten dimension, you know, ten different categories. These colors will look good together. If you have twenty, these will look good together. They can be like, you know, set next to each other and have a significant, significant difference that will show up. So he did a little bit of color research, and this way you don't have to tweak your colors. Mm -hmm. But if you want to tweak your colors, you're entirely free to. Right. And so maybe to answer the question a little bit, like to scratch the surface of yeah. if you wanted to define a custom set of colors. So when you call d3.scale.category10 right here, you're, this is really doing like d3.scale.ordinal, like that. And then once you have an ordinal scale, you can say color scale dot uh, range and give it an array of colors. And these are CSS colors, so you could do things like this, red, green. But you could also define like the dollar, you know, and the six digits, yep. six hex digits. This is how you could define your own custom colors. Cool. And then if you wanted it dynamic, you could set the range dynamically based on some drop down menu or something, and then call the render function again to set it dynamically. Cool. Yeah. Just quickly, so these yeah. colors I'm assuming are optimized for like a light background. Do you know if there's also a built-in set for, for a darker background? Interesting question. Uh, they're set, so I, I read this a long time ago, they're set actually to be distinguishable next to each other. Yeah, okay, as opposed to specific. Does it pair in lines like colored lines? I don't believe that it does. Well, no, they're just going to color wheel, and you can get the complementary. They're doing contrast over there. Yeah. If you if you want to uh, get more into colors, there's a great thing called Color Brewer, which is uh, a good thing to look into. I'm not going to really talk much about it, but like these people thought a lot about colors. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. So w now we have things as different colors, we can stack them on top of one another. But in order to do stack, uh, we need to use uh, the stack layout of D3. And this is like one of the trickier concepts, like when you come across it and try to use it, like it's kind of a stumbling block to really get started. So I thought what I'd do here is really break it down to the basics. So there's not much code here. And what this is doing is it's reading in the data file, which is the same as before. And then instead of rendering anything, it's using d3.layout.stack. And so I spent a lot of time on this documentation page, um, and it's great. Uh, and there's a lot of documentation here. So stack layout, I would encourage you to like read through this if you start working with stack layout. But how you can use it is, d3.layout.stack, when you call this, it creates a new instance of this layout, 
which will like transform your data. And when you say dot y, it's a, you're telling it, you're giving it a function that it can invoke on each data element to get the y value. And the y value is the thing that will be stacked. So if the first y value is 10, and then the second y value is like 20, and then the third value is something else, it'll compute like the, 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 the sum total of all the things that came before it and output that as what it calls y0. So here's how you specify the y accessor function, which is like, you know, the y column is population in this case. And then it's a little bit confusing because stack really works well on these two, two, um, two dimensional arrays. And this is like a degenerate case. Uh, but when you, you have to specify this function dot values, which is an accessor for the array of values for each top level entry. So imagine you have a two dimensional array for each top level array. The top level array will get passed into this accessor function values, which should return the like nested array. So this is like for mapping different data structures to this. I know it's a little confusing. Yeah, the, the later examples will. But I just had to have this like this to get it to work in this like simple case. So it's returning an array. So the values accessor has to return an array. So I just, I'm just returning an array that has one thing in it, uh, which is the element from, from the table. You know, it's an object that has these two fields, religion and population. And so, it's a little confusing, I know. We'll, we'll revisit this, this dot values function. Um, but then, once you've set it up, you can call it as a function with your data. In this case, it's, a, it's an array. And so for each element of the array, we'll call dot values to get an array of like the inner things. And then it will, you know, do a data transformation, and this is the output. And so to display the output, I'm saying d3.selectBody.append pre. Pre is a tag that just displays uh, preformatted text like this with nice indentation and stuff. And I'm saying dot text, you know, json.stringify this data. And these second two param parameters to json.stringify will tell it to do it like in a beautiful way with indentation. The indentation is two levels. So that's what we're seeing here. So this is the this is the output. This is the value of the stacked variable. So let's take let's just take a look. Like it's an array of objects, which is like pretty much the same thing as what we would see just from the parsed data, but it has these additional fields that have been added. It's y zero and y. So y is the it, y is just the value that comes out of the y accessor function. But y0 is the computed, like, stacked value. So if you look at, so if you think about, about it as a stack, uh, Christian here will be on the bottom of the stack. So it'll start at 0. But then the y0 of, this, of the next one will, it's the same value. See, 217, 217. So that will start where the previous one left off. And then the y0 for the third one will be the sum of the first two y's. Or really, it will be the y0 of the previous one plus the y of the previous one will be the y0 of the next one. And so this is what stack layout gives you, is this y0 thing. And it does this summing that you can use. So now with this value, this y0 thing, we can use this data to drive a stacked bar. And so this is what it looks like if you take this chunk of code and put it back in the bar chart, you get this stacked bar, which is like the beginning of like a, a real stacked bar chart with multiple bars. So let's just take a look at the code here, um, how this is working. So there's the color column of religion, sort of the same as what we had before. And then in the render function, it's the co same code from the previous example. It's um, yeah, computing the stack, getting the y column, just getting the this array with a single element in it because the the original data is not actually a nested structure. So this is all the same, and then 
to compute the domain of the x and the y scale is a little different here. So stacked, remember, is this data structure we saw before. Um, so for each element, it's returning the x column. This is how, how we're computing the domain of the x scale. And then to compute the domain of the y scale, it's the d3.max. So starting at 0 and going up to, yeah, actually, this, this, this is a little, a little bit tricky. So the domain of the y scale is the first element of the array is this point here, 0. And then the second element is the value of the data here. It's the maximum uh, value of all the summed things. And so to get, at, to get at the data point that is really the tip top of the stack, what you need to do is take the maximum over this function uh, y0 plus y. So d dot y0 plus d dot y. So d dot y, if you, if you do um, just d dot y0, that'll be like the base of the top uh, element of the stack. But you have to add y to y0 to get the, the, the maximum value that you really want to use uh, with the scale. So this is how you compute the, the domain of the y scale. If the population were not uh, ordered, I mean, uh, in this case it was a descending order. Mm. If they were not descending order, then is there a quick function to order them or something? Oh, yeah. So the question is, if, if it's not ordered, could you order it? Yeah, you could just use array.sort and give it a comparator that accesses the field that you want to sort by. Yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, it's just the data itself, the data table, happens to be pre-sorted, so that's why the stack, the, the elements in the stack are sorted. But if it weren't, yeah, they might be like all different sizes, like in a non-sorted way. Yeah, yeah. But it wouldn't matter for our case because we're just trying to find the max value. So yeah, for the max. Not, then, yeah, this computation would be correct. Still be right. It would be correct regardless of the sorting. Yeah. In this way, the Jewish people come out on top. <laughs> that's true, <laughs> but you can't see them. <laughs> They're so tiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, choosing the religion, I, it's just something that I've been always curious about. What is the breakdown of, world, of, pe of religions in the world, you know? But it might be a little controversial, like, I hope people don't, like, send me death threats or something. <laughs> uh, right, so, so we've computed the scales, and now let's look at how the bars code has changed. So instead of, actually maybe I should have renamed this bars to like pancakes or something. Uh, but it's still bars, really. So each element of this selection corresponds to one of these layers. And so it's a rectangle, we're using the range band still of the X scale, that's why it's like not going all the way to the outside. Same as before. And then, the x function is the same as before. We're just accessing the x column, which is world in this case. Oh, I didn't cover this, but I just added the region is world, because that wasn't in the original data, um, just as an aside. That's why the world label is there. But getting back to the bars, so to compute the y attribute of each of these rectangles, now remember, the y value Zero of the y value is at the top of the screen. And um, this inner height value would be at this baseline, the zero baseline. And so the y value is really the y scale of d dot y zero plus d dot y, which is the top of the rectangle, right? It, so we, the, the d dot y zero is the bottom of the rectangle, and d dot y itself is the height of the rectangle. So to get to the y position that's the top of the rectangle, you need to start at the bottom of the rectangle and add the height of the rectangle. So that's why it's like this, d dot y zero plus d dot y. So th that's the top of the rectangle, and then we need to give it the height of the rectangle, because that's just how SVG works. It would be more convenient maybe if you could specify like y1, y2, but you just have to specify the height. So the, the, the way that we specify the height here 
is the inner height. So remember, if, if the height of the rectangle were inner height, it would be um, the height of this entire like box here inside of the margin. So it's inner height minus y scale of d dot y. So to be honest, like I just tweaked it until it looks yeah. like the right thing. <laughs> it's like kind of heady to to think about all of this. Who controls the width of the uh, x? Uh, oh, the width. So the width. Oh, actually, I set it in the enter virtual selection. That's not really right. It really should go down here. But the width is the range the range band from the x scale. And that's something I covered in the introduction to D3. So that's like, when you specify the x scale, it's an, it's a, an ordinal scale, but with range bands, which specifies the bar padding, which is like, I think. Right, so it's like one bar and that's the padding in front of the Yeah, so the, the bar padding is, is, that's why it doesn't extend all the way to the edges. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, this, this code still throws me for a loop when I look at it. But it basically works, you know. <laughs> so like, this is how you compute the height. It's the inner height minus the y scale. So the, actually, the y scale of this <coughs> value, y scale of d dot y, will give you the height of the rectangle. But you have to start at the inner height minus that because that's how this, the scale is set up, because the maximum value of the scale is the inner height, or, or something like that. <laughs> Just sort of take my word for it, you know. Uh, so here, uh, I mean, what are you assuming as the, the size of the, the canvas? I mean, you're just assuming it's a browser or it's a smartphone, I mean. Yeah, so the size. Based on type of, uh, I mean, uh, where you are displaying it, I mean, based on the device you are going to display. Maybe, maybe you yeah, I know what you're saying. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So you're the question is, how do you do dynamic size in D3? And this is like beyond the scope of this tutorial, but this is something that I care about a lot, and I figured out how to do it. I think you covered it in your last. Yeah, I covered it in the last tutorial. But like, you can you can do something where it responds to the resize like this <coughs> by using CSS. And then using browser event listeners, um, but I'm not really going to cover this today. Okay. But in this, in, the, in these code examples, the width and the height is just hard coded to be 500 and 250 just to fit in this little box, <laughs> which is like I don't like hard doing it like this. But it's more complex code if you have it dynamically resizing. Right, so this is how you stack things in a rectangle. Are there any questions at this point? Yeah? Uh, I was just thinking about the legend. Where do you put it? I mean, uh, how do you put it at the, uh, at the start of the rectangles and the side of it? Is it just easy as adding an attribute there? Or? The legend? Yeah. I'll get to that in a pre future example. Okay. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, so for now, let's just sort of press on and, and see how can we, how can we split this bar uh, horizontally. And so what we want is each bar to correspond to a country. And then that bar will be split just like this based on the religion uh, distribution within that country. And so how can we do that? So let's just add another dimension of the data. So I changed the data table now to be uh, this data, where there's two categorical fields, you know, or dimensions in this in this table, and there's one uh, measure if you if you take the data cube terminology. So yeah, it varies by country and religion. So each for each unique combination of country and religion, there's a value for population. Yeah. Oh, it, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> so. This code here, all, all it does is parses the data and then displays the parsed data. So once we parsed it, it's an array of objects, right? This is sort of standard when you parse it. 
a CSV file, you get an array of objects with country, religion, and population. But if you think about what we want to do, we want to basically take the previous example and split it out horizontally. And so the previous example deals with a single bar as you know the world. But what we want to do is like replicate that data structure, that's the input to the previous example, for each country individually. And the way that we can do that is using d3.nest. So here's where, this is another thing that's kind of like d3.layout.stack. It can be a little tricky when you come across it for the first time, so I just wanted to lay it out here, what it does. So here we're invoking d3.nest. And then with d3.nest, you can specify keys. And so with this dot key thing. And this is a function that returns the country. And this will be like the top level of the array. And each further key you specify, it, it gives you like this nested data structure, an array of arrays sort of a thing. It's sort of complex to explain, but there's this great uh, D3 nest set of examples that's really great for learning. Oh, it's cut off there. Could you move the projector a little bit so that it's, uh, yeah, great. So if you just use one key, the value for the key is at the top level. So it's an array of objects that have key and values. And so key is the return value from the key function and values is an array of values for which the key is that key. It's like a group by that key. Yeah, it's a group by. It's a group by, exactly. And you can specify key twice here, so it's like a, a nested group by. <coughs> so it's a it's like now it gives you a tree data structure where key values, you know, is at the top level and then for each entry in the values array it's a nested uh, version of that. But so far what we're gonna do is just look at the single level mm -hmm. of nesting. So what it looks like here is the key is China for the first entry in the top level array and then the values for that are all the combinations of country and religion where country is China. So here we see China, China, China and then the next uh, value in the top level array is all the values for India. India, 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 right? So, and this is how you invoke it. You say dot entries, data, and this is when it actually does the computation of the group by. And then the return value from all of that is this data structure. So this is how you can do like an in-memory group by sort of a thing in JavaScript in preparation for stacked bar charts that are split out. So each entry here, the values will correspond to these layers in each bar, right? So each top level object here will correspond to a bar and then each thing within that will correspond to a layer of each bar. And so using this data structure as input, we can go back, oh, and so here's you can nest by country and then just by changing this to religion, you can nest by religion. I just wanted to show you can nest either way. So now it's like the top level thing is for each religion, all the different countries. So you could do it that way too. Um, but because of the way the data is, I wanted to have each bar correspond to a country and then it, it would be split up by religion because that would, that would sum to the population of that country. Whereas if we did it the other way around, because I'm just using the top five countries, it wouldn't sum to the complete population for each religion. So, But anyway, you can use nest and stack together. And this is what you need to do to create a stacked bar chart. And so here's a variant where we're nesting by Oh, I introduced a variable called layer column because we want to sort of make it more generic. And here it's religion. So each thing on the top level is a religion and each value. So the, the overall structure is the same as before, but now we're passing it through d3.layout.stack, which will assign these y0 values that we need to like build up the bars. And so d3.layout.stack, the y accessor is d at the y column which here is population. 
And then the dot values accessor here is different from the first stack example. Now it's returning d dot values. And this is the more idiomatic thing that you would encounter when using the stack layout. Um, so d dot values is this array, right? So for each element of the top level array, the values that it will use are, you know, in the values property of that element of the array. So it's like a little quirky, but like this is how you just how you use d3.nest and d3.stack. And so when you pass everything through, this is the data structure you get. And this is how we actually want to do the nesting for the stacked bar chart because if you look at the y0 values for all of the Christian entries, they're all going to be zero, right? So that's because the Christian thing will be the the first uh, the first like slab of this of this layout. You know, it's going to start at the bottom of y0 is zero for all of these, and then. Uh, <laughs> well, the first layer, you know, the first <laughs> layer, okay. And then the second layer will be the, the Muslim entries. And so the Y0 for these will be, will be higher. I know, it's not politically correct, right? <laughs> but you got to visualize it somehow. Maybe I should just randomize it so it's different every time. <laughs> So this is a little bit tricky because the top level grouping is by religion. And so when we do the code for the bars, it'll be a little odd. You know, it's not every entry for a country, it's every entry for a religion. So let's just take a look how you do stacked bars. So here's, here's what it looks like. So just observe this for a second. Like I was amazed when I actually saw this data for the first time. Actually, in the next example, I add a legend. I'll just show it to you now so you can read the chart. So, it's just, it's fascinating. So, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating thing to look at. You can see that, like, in the U.S., most people are Christian, and also in Brazil, but in Indonesia, most people are, are, uh, oh. Sorry. Yeah, when I turn, it's... So... <laughs> yeah, isn't it interesting? Most of the people in China are unaffiliated. Yeah, right. It's because the, I don't know, the Cultural Revolution. I, I, I also, this is a really good example of choosing the correct visualization mm. of the data because it stuff that would be hard to see in the numbers. Oh yeah, and I've had this data kicking around in some folder for a long time and I, I never saw the structure of it like this. So it was really fascinating for me like to just make this chart and just look at it, you know? And see how many Hindus there are in India? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a side question. Um, so now all, all those data that you had lying everywhere is now in your data repository? Or data oh, so... It's worth mentioning that, um, oops, ah. all of the data for this project is in this uh, GitHub repository called data. And I have a lot of data sets that I've sort of collected over the years in here, and I want to visualize all of them. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it's hard to, hard, to, hard to do it all. But this religion data set is in here. Under um, Pew, where is it? Pew Religion. I'm amazed that it's not starred as much as it's supposed to be. <laughs> 45 stars. Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's not th that accessible. But inside of this directory is the processing script that I used to prepare this exact uh, data. Because the original data has, like, for all countries of the world. And so I just limited it to be the top five. But if you look at um, the original data, you can see there's entries for every single country in the world. So this would be fascinating to really look through in more detail. Yeah, I'd be, curi I'd be curious the, to the see. Show you those. Yeah, it'll show you. It would also be interesting to show each country as the same block and it would have a big percentage. Because then you could see, so 
mm. smaller populated countries. Yeah, large. right. That's true. Like, rather than having them get smaller, they could all be the same size, so you could just see the breakdown within each country. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. So, so there's one interesting data set that I have, which I talked about. It's uh, called termination rates, where I was doing some telecom analysis. So different term, if it's landline or cell phone, terminate the call at different rates. And when you look at countries which are really small, like small islands, Vanuatu or whatever, mm -hmm. and the cell phone cost versus the landline, it's really interesting that I was mm. talking about So I mean, that's kind of an interesting case. Yeah, cool. And then the other thing is you really have to watch out for people from India. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's let's <laughs> so let's uh, <coughs> Let's look at the code here and see how this stacked layout thing is working, right? So it's the same data structure we were looking at before. Wait, okay. Before we add a legend, let's look at the code. So in the render function, we're, we're, you, we're doing the same thing as the previous example. We're nesting and then stacking the data, and then the result is in this, uh, this variable called layers. So each layer here is the set of bars that's the same color, okay? So the first entry in the layers array is, corresponds to all of the blue mm -hmm. rectangles. Not the countries, but the sets of sa similarly colored rectangles. Um, so, computing the X scale domain is fairly straightforward because, like, we're taking the first uh, layer and for the values of the first layer, just extracting the value for the X column, which is the countries. So, like, layers at, at index zero will be, I think, uh, the Christian entries. And so the va values of that is the list of countries, right? What would If all the values were zero, I mean, this the the list of countries would still be there. I, I, I think what he, are, are you asking, say for example, if uh, it doesn't look like there's many Muslims in Brazil, is that what you're asking? No, if the value was zero? Oh. Because it would be zero, it would still be a value. Yeah, the stack layout, like if the population were zero, 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 it would still, they would still have entries, but the values would just be zero. So now we're just looking at the... So the arbitrary, whichever layer. Right. Yeah. I'm just taking the first one because that's yeah. just the only way I could really <coughs> see how to do it. Yeah. It's, it's a, it maybe it always doesn't feel quite right if I access the first element of an array, but like, yeah. I don't know. It's just it made sense. So this is how we're getting the list of countries. You know, China, India, USA. That's the X scale domain, and then the Y scale domain. This is the min and max of the Y scale, right? So deep inside here is the same logic we had before, but it's applied to the values for each layer, and we're doing a, a nested d3.max. Because what we're doing here is, for each inner call here, we're computing the value at the top of each country bar. And then we're taking the max over all of those. So let's look at the code. <coughs> the the y-scale domain <coughs> is an array where the first entry is zero, the second entry is a d3.max of this function over each layer. Um, so for each layer, we're looking at all the values, and each entry in this values array has this y0 and y computed by the stack layout, and then the sum of y0 and y is the top of the rectangle, so this inner d3.max is computing uh, the maximum value. Uh, well, you're summing over each one of them just to get the top itself, right? Yeah, you're, you're, you're going over all the layers for oh, sorry, each one, uh, summing all the countries just to get what's the, what's the total of that country. That's what you're doing. Well, actually, let's look at the, the previous example. So that layers thing is this array here right where the the values array is each different country 
within a particular religion. So, if we go back and look at this, um, each entry in layers is a religion. And um, so, like, each time this function gets invoked, layer is, for example, uh, Christian. It's the, the, it's all the entries for the blue rectangles, right? So the max of this call will be, in the first iteration, it'll be this, this value here for USA. And then the second iteration through the layers array would be all of these um, uh, orange squares. So the top value would be maybe this one. Uh, and then it, it'll go through everything. Actually, now that I think about it, I could just take the last the last entry in layers. No, I think you have to, I, I think you have to go through them all. Yeah, I think you have to go through them all. That's a select function, by the way. That looks good. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> so, actually, by the way, let me just say, I took this from this example, stacked to grouped bars by Mike Bostock, where he solved the same problem. <clears throat> and you can actually transition between stacked and grouped. It's really crazy. And uh, <clears throat> he had the same function here, d3.max layers. For each layer, return the max of y0 plus, and it gets cut off others. So I basically took the same logic from here, but it took me a while to understand it. But yeah, I think you're right. You need do, I think you do need to look at all of them, because the ordering might. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You, you effectively, it's finding the height of China because it's the, it ends up being the biggest. But if you didn't know that, it might right. shrink the domain to the next. Right. But wouldn't the inner, the inner max, you can just get the last element because the y not. Yeah, that's what I just occurred to me right now. Yeah, because the y not and the y would be the highest point of that of each country. Yeah. You so you just put it into the other max, mm -hmm. and it computes the max of all the countries. The so, so maybe it could look like this, and you could get rid of one level. And then you reduce uh, computation. Yeah, that might work actually. Food for thought, <laughs> right? <laughs> the, the reason why I guess my boss can do what. He did was because if you have different numbers per each country, so if you have yeah. no, different numbers of religion per each country, yeah. and they're not the same, hmm. then that's why you have to compute each one of them. I, I should try this and see if it works, because intuitively, the the last layer is the highest layer. Yeah. Food for thought, but I'm glad we got into this because we're really understanding this a little better. It gets confusing only, with these. Only if they're ordered that way. Yeah, but they must be ordered that way because this was passed through uh, the stack layout. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't see that before. Fork a block. Yeah, fork my block. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is how you compute the domain of the Y scale. Now, this is where we get into the D3 stuff. So, if you look at the DOM here, there's a, a layer group element for each of these uh, layers. So if you look at the DOM by clicking inspect element, we can see that there's a layer, a group element here, that contains all the blue rectangles. Okay. And then if we were to look at the next layer, it contains all of the uh, orange rectangles. Okay, so this organization is, for me, it was counterintuitive. I wanted to have one group per country. But because the way that it's computed with the stack layout has to be like this instead, which I was, it was a little confusing. But here's how you do it. So for each... Um, so, we're, so G is the container for the stuff that's inside of the margin here. 
and then g.selectAll.layer. So we're selecting all the elements that have a class of layer, which there's none in the beginning. And then we do a data, a data join with the layers. And then on the enter of virtual selection, we're appending a group element and giving it a class of layer. And so this is the D3 enter exit update thing. And then in the update cycle here, we're, we're saying that the fill style of all the stuff that will be in this group will be set to, you know, evaluate the color scale of D.Key. And remember, D.Key is the value we passed in here for uh, the key of the nest, which is the layer column, which is, um, in this case, it's religion. It's layering by religion. And it's going across, the X, the X scale would be country. The layers is religion, which is the same as the color column. So, um, so it's interesting. If you see the rect, the rect elements, there's no fill attribute. It's, the fill is applying to the group. So once we have the groups, um, we're doing a nested selection. So this is, this is really cool, but also really a little tricky to understand like this nested selection idea. Uh, but Mike Bostock has this really great elaborate post on this, uh, this whole concept of nested selections. So you could do like a select all dot select all like this. Um, so you could do these nested selections. So let's see how it plays out in this case. So the top level selection is these layers. So, all right, we created a layer group for each religion. And then for each layer group, we want to add all the rectangles that correspond to the diff different countries for that group. And so we're doing layer groups dot select all rect dot data. So we're doing a data join on a function. And that function gets called for every entry in the, the, the higher level of the selection. So for each layer entry, so D here, maybe I should really call it layer. It's an entry in, in, that, uh, in that data structure that we had with the key and the values. So we're extracting the values for that particular layer. And then so each entry in the values array will correspond to one rectangle here. And then we do the enter exit thing. And then uh, the D that we're dealing with in these functions is the lowest level of detail. You know, it's a combination of religion and country. And so we can extract the X column, which is country. And then for Y, we can use the same logic as we did before in, the, in just where it was just a single bar. So the Y is the Y scale uh, at the Y zero plus Y, you know, the bottom of the rectangle plus the height of the rectangle, which is D dot Y. Um, and then this is all the same stuff as before, really. And so it's just this logic of the nested selection that you really got to grok. Um, Maybe I'll just run through this, this whole thing. Do you, are you guys good with this? When yeah. Oh, I just modified that. No, it's just within this function, within this one little function. Yeah, we use D everywhere. It gets a little confusing, but I mean, that's what I see in all the D three examples. Yeah, maybe this really should be layer. Yeah, because each layer contains the key, which is religion, and the values, which is the the thing that came out of d3.nest, where each, each entry here is a combination of religion and country, where the religion is, they're all the same in each layer. So like in the first layer, they're all the, it's all the Christian entries. In the second layer, it's all the Muslim entries, and so on. So here's how you do stacked bar charts. 
And for me, like, I've always wanted to make a stacked bar chart, but I never could figure it out. And it's like the holy grail for me, you know? Like, <laughs> Uh, but now I finally feel like I understand it. So I wanted to do it, do this presentation. It's pretty laborious, though. Yeah, it is. To really understand it, it's it's not easy. Well, you've done an incredible amount of work here. It just reduces like, oh, I'm copy everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. No, these are these examples are designed to be copied and and, and modified. I plan to release all of these as blocks so that you can just fork them and, and work with them. I'm just surprised that D3 doesn't have more of a domain-specific language to yeah. be able to say what you want. Rather right, I know, I know. It's such a, just a big distance. Yeah, and that's why I think that you have so many libraries built on top of D3 where people desire a higher level, like a grammar of graphics. Yeah. There was that great book, The Grammar of Graphics by Leland Wilkinson, where he defined us exactly a language where you could define these things. Stacked bars is just like when you want to expand it like this, it's just like adding a one little thing yeah. in some algebra, right? That's really how it should be. Yeah. But, I mean, so this is how you... Well, yeah, I mean, because you can do it like this in D3, yeah. you can make a higher level language like that. Isn't this a block type in Kaizen? Oh, it will be. <laughs> so in the Kaizen project, I want to make all of these available as plugins, or maybe ideally have like a grammar-based system, but it's, I haven't quite got there yet. I haven't quite figured it out. The best is Google Drive Excel sheet. If you just put some data and mm. select some data, it'll actually give you a recommendations of what kind of plots. Yeah, I from. saw that. They recently rolled out this awesome. like automatic thing. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. It automatically generates these visualizations for you. So now that we have a stacked bar chart, uh, <coughs> which religion is green again? <laughs> oh, you guys know. Well, if you didn't know, <laughs> we have to add a color legend. So this is how you add a color legend. So there was a recent project done called D3 Legend by uh, Susie Liu. So this is an open source thing, and it's extremely well documented. And you can make legends like this without writing your own D3 code for it. You can just sort of invoke her uh, library, and it's very well documented. It's, it's Beautiful, beautiful work. Talk. Yeah, yeah, she great, gave a meetup talk a uh, few, few weeks ago. Uh, five weeks ago. Five weeks ago. <laughs> sure does. But anyway, I'm going to use that. And um, a while ago, I made this block that just uses D3 Legend. Just I wanted to figure out how how it looked like to use it. And so it's just including a script, and then you say color legend equals D3 Legend dot color which is from this library. And then you just configure it with all these various parameters. Uh, one of them is that you pass in the scale, you pass in the label format, and like the padding between shapes, the shape width, the shape height, all these little things that you can tweak. You know? So that's what gives you this nice color legend. So I'm not writing any D3 that renders these rectangles. Like That's all inside of that library. And we can just use it. And so to, to actually add that here, so I added a script tag to include that library. Um, and then I you know, added some CSS to make it a nice looking font and like set the size of the font for this thing that has a class color legend that I added, let's see, below. So I added a group, color legend G is a group element that has a class color legend so we can use CSS on it and then just transforming it by this translation that just moves it to be in a certain location uh, that I just tweaked until it looked nice, <laughs> you know. And then um, the color scale was there before. And here's the configuration of the color legend. Just, you know, creating the legend and passing in our color scale that we had before. And then just setting up all these little configuration parameters so it looks just right. How would you reverse uh, Make it upside down. You know. uh, how would you reverse it? Because uh, the Christian is on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Actually, I wanted to do that. It, it, you're right. Like order it by yeah. size? Well, well it, sh it should be the s order. same order. Same order. Yeah. Oh, oh, it actually yeah. is sorted by the biggest first. 
but it doesn't look like that. Well, the, the issue here is the ordering in, within each bar is not the same as the ordering in the legend. Yeah. 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 They're opposite. They're reversed. It's yeah. reversed. Um, and you can do that if you were to um, reverse it at some point in here. And I didn't go through and do it, but you can do it. I actually did that for a later example, example that we'll cover. Okay. Well, maybe we won't cover it. It's taking a long time to go through these. <laughs> but um, you, can, you can definitely do that. And I, I noticed this only after I had created all the other examples, so I didn't go back and figure it out. But you can just do a dot reverse somewhere in here. That will reverse the array. But you need to be careful to do it at the right spot, because <laughs> otherwise it reverses in both. You know, uh, you just have to go through and figure figure out where to reverse an array. <laughs> but um, yeah, color legend G dot call, which is a D three pattern where you use the library color legend. And so it's, it's very easy. You know, Susie Lou has created a great API for legends, and I'm just using it here. So legendary. it's legendary. <laughs> it is. But before this, you had to write a bunch of code, like you were asking about, to like get the offset just right and like make the rectangle the right size. And so she encapsulated that, and I'm just using it here. <clears throat> so that's how you add a color legend. Let's see, grouped bars. So this whole stacked bar thing draws from this um, stacked to grouped bars example from Mike Bostock, where it actually has this sweet transition. And so I just uh, studied this example. And you just have to modify in a few places to switch it between stacked and grouped bars. And so I'll just go through this code for grouped bars. So here it is, grouped bars. It's presenting the same data, but just uh, in a different, different organization, different layout. So this is not using the Y0 property because it's putting everything at the baseline of, of the axis. So <clears throat> let's just go through and see where things had to change for this. Um, You know, I wish I had like a diff, you know, like a diff between these. Because I actually don't remember exactly where it changed. Um, well, if we look at the stack to grouped, <coughs> we can see that, um, right, when we're, when we're computing the max value for the y-axis, instead of d.y0 plus y, we're just using d.y. So, Right here it is. The y scale, it's just using d dot y here because d dot y is the height of the bar here. And so we want to take the max <coughs> over all the bars basically and get the largest bar and make that the, the, the highest value for the uh, domain of the y scale. And then here, um, we need to offset each bar a little bit. And this is something that I, I learned, I didn't know you could do. There's a J property that's exposed in these callbacks. And so with D3, usually it's a function that operates on a data element D, right? And the second argument to this function is I, the index in the array. But when you use nested selections, you actually get J, which is the index of the like the parent selection, which like is so cool. Like I didn't know you could do that. And so I split out the computation of bar width here. So instead, before the bar width was just x scale dot range band, which is like the full, the full width of the bar in the previous example. So we're taking that and we're dividing it by the number of entries in the color scale domain, which is, I could have referenced that in some other way, uh, but it's basically the number of religions. So it's dividing that 
the width of the bar by the number of religions to get you the width of this, this smaller bar that we want here. And then we're, um, we're computing the x scale of the value for the x column and then offsetting it by bar width times j. Uh, so you stepped out, but j, j is um, the index of the element in the parent selection with these nested selections. And so bar width times j will offset the bar, right? And so this is how you compute the x offset for these bars. Um, and then in this, the rest of the code, uh, we just removed y0 from the whole thing. So we're not using y0. We're not, we're not using that part of the stack layout. Actually, we're not using the stack layout at all. We could take out the stack layout part because it's just, just nested data, really. Um, actually, I, never, I didn't think of that before, but we don't need the stack layout because we're not using y0. Um, so yeah, this is how you, you do grouped bars. It's just a slight modification of stacked bars. Yeah, the question is. Yeah, it's 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 not as interesting to read in a way, and I I think uh, it's a matter of like aesthetics, and it depends on the data. I think it really depends a lot on the data because uh, in cases where there's very little variation between them, like I mean, it would be interesting to find a data set where this would give you a more readable thing because this lets you compare directly the height of each adjacent bar. Ah. Yeah. And so, a, a yeah. A place where I've seen it do really good is comparison of various operations in various browsers, like array.sort and mm. Firefox or IE or whatever, because um, the values are, are closer together. It would show you, this would be good for where data is not so widely disparate as it was. On, on, on that one, because there was like Brazil had hardly any in most of the, the categories. But if you wanted to see like it's a race or it's faster in Firefox or Safari, you know, mm. or um, various other operations, it, it would be useful. Staying with your religion and geography um, kind of things, if you took different counties in the United States and looked at religious oh, yeah. distributions, you'd see a lot of variations if you go to. Right. Park in yeah. Park see, that's, if yeah. If you go to Utah, if you go to San Francisco, you'll see 99% of the uh, That's a beautiful thing about this theme because you can, you, can, you can look at different levels of detail. Like each one of these could be a U.S. state or a U.S. county or a city mm -hmm. even. Um, and it, 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 could, it doesn't need to be religions. Like you could look at different uh, ethnicities also, and do the same kind of uh, visualization. That might be interesting. Sorry, does it break down things like Mormon and stuff like that, or does it all follow the other? Pew has hundreds of data sets. And so maybe somewhere in there, there's something like that where it breaks down Christianity into the sub. Denominations. Denominations, thank you. <laughs> See, I'm not very politically correct. But, uh, you know. <laughs> But that's actually the beauty, beauty of like the data cube conceptual framework. So like this is not using any OLAP anything, but if you were, it would be storing those hierarchies and you could use the, the OLAP queries to like navigate down into these nested structures, like breaking down Christian into the denominations or breaking down the country into the regions within the country. Because maybe, I don't know, maybe in China, like certain regions, like maybe it, it Different, maybe the region, regions differentiate themselves a lot more when you break it down. I don't know. Yeah. So that, yeah, group, grouped bars. So, let's see. I, I don't know if I'll be able to cover all the examples, but I'll, I'll try, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that was like, that was like one, one avenue of exploration, you know, rectangles and splitting up rectangles, but let's get circular now. <laughs> so 
here's a here's a circle that represents the world. Popu oh yeah, you got a question about the bars? Well, if you wanted to see, yeah, the question is, if you wanted to see all countries, how might you approach that? Um, I've seen Tableau do it where instead of vertical bars, it's this, this exact visualization, but it's horizontal bars. And then it just, you can scroll and make the bars smaller, maybe. So make the bars half this size, make it horizontal, and then have it scrollable. Because it's going to scroll off the screen. There's like two... 100 something, how many countries? 200 something. And growing. <laughs> <laughs> so it would scroll off the page, but you would probably see like a power law distribution sort of a thing where it's like most of the population are in like the top 10 countries and then it sort of peters off. <laughs> but actually, I have all the data there if you look in the repository. So you, I would leave that as an exercise for the reader like, to actually do that because it's totally possible. It's not that hard. To do, you would just have to, you would just have to enable scrolling, or something. Yeah. One thing that can be done if many countries are very similar, they like bubble graph. Mm. Uh, so it it can be accommodated at the same space, but there will be bubbles. Mm. Uh, of or I mean like the, China will have a bigger. Bubble. So many small countries can be represented using bubble graph. Mm. Same space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. Scroll yeah, that's interesting. Like, do you mean like bubbles that are like packed together, like circle yes. circle yeah. packing? Yeah. yeah, that would be cool. That would be a cool way to do it. What happens when the bubble explodes? <laughs> 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 well, the whole point of seeing them is so you can compare visually together. You right. can't see them all together in the same kind of thing. It yeah. It's the purpose. Yeah, and I had one thought actually. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's worth getting into. <laughs> but like if you had if you had all the countries, it would probably be like big ones and then it gets smaller and smaller and then you have a bunch of white space there. So you could use that space maybe to plot the smaller countries. I don't know, just so maybe, like a uh, concept. So if you could go by uh, like a continent like Europe, Asia, and... All right. Yeah, if you wanted to visualize the whole world, you could use continents instead and maybe have it so you can, like, drill down to each continent. There's a lot of different ways you could approach that, like, but how do you represent all countries? It's kind of like a deep question of, like, visualization. Um, it, it all depends more what you're looking for. Yeah, it really depends on the task, what you're looking for. You use your charting library and have one graph and then drill down. If you know yeah, linked views. Linked views could be, that's what the power of linked views, because like if you have one view at the level of continents, you could sort of hover, and then maybe that would like show you a bar chart of the countries in that particular continent. Like what you showed in the beginning, not in, after the intent to, but the thing you're working on, where you kind of mm -hmm. like scroll over something and decide. And just yeah. That. Yeah, that's the, the project I'm working on with linked views, chiasm. It, en it enables you to have multiple charts where if you interact in one,